allow me to introduce Professor Yagi. Professor Omar Yagi is a James and Nauti Trader Chair Professor of Chemistry at University of California, Berkeley. He's a founding director of the Berkeley Global Science Institute, and he's also the co-director of the Calvi Energy Nanosciences Institute, the California Research Alliance by BASF, and the Baker Institute of Digital Materials for the Planet. Professor Yagi is widely known for establishing the field of reticular chemistry and for pioneering metal-organic frameworks and covalent organic frameworks. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the German National Academy of Sciences, La Podia. He has also been honored with many awards, including the Albert Einstein World Award of Science in 2017, Wolf Prize in Chemistry in 2018, the Soviet Prize in 2024, and most recently, the 2024 Tang Prize in Sustainable Development for Pioneering Moths and Coughs and Opening the Door for Carbon Capture, Hydrogen and Methane Storage, as well as Water Harvesting from Desert Air. So without any further ado, let's welcome Professor Omar Yagi. Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. I want to thank the organizing committee for putting on a great uh, conference. I want to thank Dan Zhao for his initiative and um, for putting together a program of, of stars. I'm very happy to be here to share with you my ideas about reticular chemistry. And you can see my title is Modus Operandi of reticular chemists. And basically, I want to talk about the way we do things. How do we work in reticular chemistry in the hope that we can continue to thrive in this great field? So there are two components to what I want to talk about. Uh, the first component is that I think many of us who have been in this field for a while recognize that very recently, I think we have a feeling that we found our North Star. And what I mean by that is that we found the focus, the guidance, the direction. And I don't mean that that's everything we will do, but definitely the field has found its orientation. So the North Star, let me give you my ideas about what I mean by that. <clears throat> Since what I want to say is that climate to chemistry and climate to reticular chemistry is really what design of drugs are to organic chemistry and to chemistry at large. This is the very first time since total synthesis and drug design where we have potentially infinite funding to do chemistry. That's climate, okay? Almost every government in the major government of major country in the world is putting in billions of dollars to address climate change. Climate change is now, people are aware of it on the street, and so governments are delivering a lot of funding. And who do you think is gonna solve the climate problem? The periodic table. Who knows how to deal with the periodic table? Chemists. Who is making the materials that are at the forefront? You, in reticular chemistry. So this is part of that North Star, is that we are at a time in the history of chemistry and reticular chemistry where we will have relatively infinite amount of funding to do our research and to grow the field to new heights. The second thing, and this is, could not have been even more fortunate, is that we also, when you combine AI, now you've hit two revolutions. You've hit the climate revolution, and you've hit the AI revolution, and reticular chemistry is at the heart of that. Okay, so let me just 
give you my thoughts about where morph chemistry might be. And this is, a, some of you may think it's an exaggeration or an overstatement, and some of you who've been in the field for a while might think it's justified. I think it's justified, it's my own thought. I think the progress of civilizations have always tracked with how well people design materials. The, f the more we design materials on a finer and finer level, the larger and larger the economies became, and of course, civilization progressed. And in fact, we used to call the ages of civilization in terms of the materials that we were using, like the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, okay? And then we became very sophisticated in the design of materials and use of materials such as wood, clay, cement, paint, cloth, paper, combustion engine, jet engines, glass, okay? And telecommunication, silicon, something close to chemistry is polymers and drug design. So what is next? Okay, I think if you know me, it's, it's gonna be moths. I don't think this is an exaggeration. We can design materials from nature's components, organic and inorganic, to make materials by design, okay? And already in this short period of time, in the grand scheme of things, we've made more materials than ever before in humanity. And why? Because we asked an important question in chemistry. And the question is, what happens when molecules start interacting with together strongly? We understood if you design a drug molecule, you crystallize it, they're interacting through weak interactions. But what happens in chemistry when molecules start interacting through strong bonds, covalent bonds, strong metal ligand bonds, where you have a metal and a charged ligand. What happens? Well, we know what happens. We make moths and coughs, and they have progressed chemistry beyond the weak bond to the strong bond chemistry. And the result, the result has been moths and coughs and molecular weaving, and there will be many more to come based on this concept. So just in case you don't know what reticular chemistry is, it's the design uh, linking of building blocks through strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. We couldn't have been more fortunate in stating this definition in that it has three components. One component is linking building blocks so that you can begin to think about design and design extended structures. Strong bonds so that the materials you make are robust and they can stay in a power plant for many, many years without having to be replenished or replaced. And the third component is crystalline. Crystalline one, because you want to be able to design the materials um, and, and understand what you've done and characterize them at the molecular level, atomic molecular level. And second, is that many applications, including water harvesting, rely heavily on a crystalline material. Without a crystalline material, highly crystalline material, water harvesting is not energy efficient. So we have a great new chemistry that has propelled the larger chemistry from molecules to extended structures, to 2D infinite and 3D infinite structures. So we asked an important question, and we addressed that question by addressing the crystallization problem. And that's why we are where we are today in terms of making new materials with 
great ease. So let me just show you what are the strengths of Richard Kirkham. This is not a comprehensive list, but this is, I'm trying to make a point, is that they are easy to make new crystals. This is amazing in chemistry. Easy to make new crystals? As a student, I used to, I spent my entire graduate student life trying to make crystals of my, my material, my, my, my compound. It wasn't even an extended structure, it was a molecular structure. Easy to get crystal structures thanks to the development of new fast techniques, such as diffraction techniques, including electron diffraction, as we as we heard from our first plenary speaker in this conference. Easy to obtain a property, especially porosity. We have more porous materials than zeolites or any other porous materials. Okay? Easy to vary the constituents in composition, in size, shape, connectivity. And that's only on the molecular level. When you go to the macro level, there is even more control. Easy to post-synthetically modify, thanks to Seth Cohen's pioneering work. And easy to attract talent and funding. And I didn't want to list it here, but easy to get a job. <laughs> easy to get tenure. And uh, the uh, editors of the great journals should close their ears. Easy to get high impact publications. <laughs> easy to build a career. Easy to pay for tuition for the children, okay? All these things come because reticular chemistry is not just a field that has survived the old chemistry, but it has also thrived. This is really, if I was to distillate the whole of reticular chemistry and what we've done, if you think it, you can make it. And the key here, and much more, okay? So this is why the field exploded. It's being investigated in 100 countries, and I don't need to tell you this in all parts of the world. So everything is hunky-dory. Hunky-dory means very satisfactory and pleasant. Okay, so what's the problem? Why am I up here if everything is hunky-dory? Is that somewhere, so, so where, sorry, so where is the difficulty? Or perhaps, where are the opportunities? Many people ask me, everything has been done in reticular chemistry, where, where, where do we go? Actually, very little has been done in reticular chemistry. That's the ironic thing about this field. Let's think about what happens to the molecule when it goes into an extended structure. The molecule itself in solution is a complex object, okay? When you put it in a solid, although you are pinning it down, but you're multiplying the complexity across the whole crystal, across billions and billions of molecules, and potentially each set of these molecules could have variable stereochemistry, not to mention defects, and not to mention what's happening on the interior of the crystal versus the surface. Everything about a moth or a cough is variable. And in fact, that's where the opportunities are, and very few of us has, are exploiting that. I think the work of Andrew Goodwin is very important in this direction. I think this is, this is where the opportunities are. I think they are in identifying what these variations are, in characterizing what these variations are, and to characterize them, you need new tools. We don't have those tools. And then to use them. So this is what I would say the opportunity is in pursuing the multi-variation problem in MOFs. 
because you've taken a molecule and you're holding it in a solid and you have billions and billions of molecules and they create lots and lots of complexity. We have to identify this complexity, classify it, characterize it. Why is this important? Because it affects the very foundation of the whole of chemistry, is that it affects the sameness criteria. Today, when you ask if I have a, a material and I, I have two materials and I want to know if they're exactly the same or not, I ask about, do they have the same composition and structure? And if they do, they are the same material. But with MOFs, that is not true. Is that the multivariation gives you sequence of information that adds to the sameness criteria. We need to, because these variations give you properties, new properties that the ideal material doesn't, then we have to add it to the sameness criteria. Okay, so, so a reticular chemist at, uh, as, a, as a very rudimentary um, exercise, we need to be able to characterize our materials better. We need to strive to characterizing our materials better. Just getting a crystal structure, and most of the time inaccurate crystal structure, is not enough. So we, as reticular chemists, have followed this cycle in our work. And many of us, including myself, sometimes have done it poorly. So I would say that as a, if you really want to be a reticular chemist, that a respectable one, you need at least to do this cycle perfectly. And follow the Henry Ford's saying in the, that quality means doing it right when no one is looking. This is the part of our papers that are sometimes ends up in supplementary information. It needs to be done perfectly well, okay? I know we don't get much credit for it, but it, is, it defines who we are as scientists. So what makes reticular chemistry special is this cycle, is that not only in our labs, in the labs of many of us, we have carried out the entire cycle. That's new in chemistry. We've gone from the molecule to the material and taken the material, engineered it into a form that would maximize its properties to the system and then to society. That is really the blueprint of reticular chemistry, is that we can, with some effort, but it's feasible, and we and others have shown this, that we can go from the molecule all the way to society. We can do it practically, and we also can do it computationally across the different scales. Okay, so now I want to show you two applications that affect our lives that are at the forefront of reticular chemistry, and they are the ones that I would say have helped us define the North Star. Okay, the idea that our chemistry can solve societal problem. The CO2 problem, this phenomena of a heat dome, I just became familiar with it, maybe I'm an ignorant person, but we've been having heat domes in the US every year. And so that's a, we're emitting too much CO2. What are the requirements for a good carbon capture material? Okay, I think many of us know this. You need a high capacity material, you need a high selectivity, water stability, okay, it's a, they're all on there. Okay, it's a tall order, oh, excuse me, sorry, 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 uh, let's go back. It's a tall order, but it's not beyond the capabilities that are created in reticular chemistry. And so here's a material we call MOF, this is MOF 808, functionalized, with an amino, amino functionality, okay, I have to figure out. 
where this is uh, glycine, and glycine has a carboxylate that binds strongly to zirconium, so it doesn't escape, and there is an amine, a primary amine, that will seek CO2 from air. Okay? And you can see the power of MOFs in that you can functionalize the material with post-synthetically with glycine so that the amino are exposed and ready to take up CO2 from air. But we learned from these experiments that in fact water in the air help us in shifting the equilibrium towards bicarbonate and carbamic acid and therefore for each amine we can bind one CO2 instead of the dry conditions where you have two amines bind to one CO2. So water helps us in, in the carbon capture problem. Okay, so this is the experiment that many of us, such as in my group or Jeff Long's group or Omar Farha's group, in many of our groups, we try to do, which is that you have a material, you think it's a good material, you expose it to air, and you see whether it takes up CO2 or not. And so this material that I just showed you, as soon as it's exposed to air containing 400 ppm, I have to figure out how to use this, okay. Okay, 400 ppm of CO2, it drops to zero. It takes up that CO2 and stays in the pores until the pores are completely saturated before it breaks through. And look at the, at higher humidity, the uptake is even more. Okay, in this case, it's not glycine, but it's lysine because it's more basic. The capacity is quite nice. It's 1.2 millimole per gram. And the theoretical studies tell us that that's okay as long as you can cycle 100,000 cycles. But this material can't. Did you hear me in the back? <laughs> and so, <laughs> We, we scaled up this material to a kilogram quantity and, it turn, and we cycled, we built a machine, a prototype, and we cycled 500 times and it breaks down because although it's stable in water and acid, it's not stable in base. And that's why we were preparing for this in terms of the basic chemistry, you go to coughs. This cough is made from carbon-carbon bonds. Who among us dreamt that we can make coughs from carbon-carbon bonds crystalline. It's an impossibility, but this is now possible. And you can see that this material is stable in 12 molar hydrochloric acid, saturated KOH, and even N-butyllithium, and such corrosive solid. This is the material that you want to use for air capture, because it's stable and potentially it can stay in the device for many, many years. This is the result. Okay, I'm showing you the result here of taking Berkeley air and pushing it through this cough, a powder of this cough. And here you see the CO2 level at the top in Berkeley. You see the humidity in Berkeley below that. And then you see in the blue bars the CO2 uptake. And it's, it varies not because the material is unstable, but because the uptake is proportional to how much water is in the air. And if you compare the result at the same humidity, it does not change, in this case, over 100 cycles. And we continue to cycle this material. This, the uptake of this material is 1.5 millimole of CO2 per gram. Not only from air does it take CO2, but also from flue gas, much higher capacity. What does this mean? This means that reticular chemistry is delivering on making materials that ultimately will reach society. Okay, we can trap CO2 from air. It is no longer a, fi a fiction story, okay? And the fact that this material potentially it can last seven years into the device makes it very affordable at the end of the day. Okay, so we continue to work on this, but let me leave you with this. CO2 
in the air is affecting our lives and our livelihoods. It needs to be taken out. Okay? And reticular chemistry potentially has the solution. And only reticular chemistry in terms of stability and cyclability. Water is another problem, and some of you heard me talk about this, but let me just state that a quarter of a humanity will have a water crisis. And it's not just in arid regions of the world, but also in the more humidified regions of the world where we're using more of the underground water than is being replenished. And even in parts of the world where there is plenty of water, but it's not clean. So the idea is that if I could make a material that takes up water from the red regions, it will take up water everywhere in the world. And that's what we have succeeded in doing in terms of making a MOF. We call it MOF 303, it's made from aluminum and from pyrazolate. And you see here the isotherm is heaven sent, right? The isotherm shows that you take up water at very low humidity, at 10%. 10% relative humidity. In fact, you take a water at 5% relative humidity, but not many people live there. 10% relative humidity is very low. And, and, and this is something that we couldn't design yet, okay? And that is that the material, when you look at the interior of the material, you have a hydrophilic sites and hydrophobic sites, hydrophilic and hydrophobic pockets into which water goes. Water goes directly to the hydrophilic sites and bridges over the hydrophobic sites to make a material that has a, what I call a push-pull interaction with water. The key here, and I'll show you what is water doing into the pores. The key is that the very first water molecules go into the hydrophilic adsorptive site. That water molecule becomes a seed onto which other water molecules bind. And so you have a cooperative, an isotherm that looks like a cooperative phenomenon. Okay, you have a cooperative uptake of water. And when we do water harvesting, we're, we are not taking the first water molecule out. We're keeping it in the pore because it costs you more energy to take it out. What I want to show you now is something that really surprised me at the time, which was that I challenged the theoretician, namely Joaquim Sawa and Laura Gagliotti, to find where the water molecules are residing in the structure computationally. We knew the results from experiment, but we did not give them the answer. And they came back with at least the primary sites being right on. Okay? I became a believer in looking deeper into computational tools to aid in designing structures and in understanding water absorption. So I want to show you now a movie that shows exactly where the water molecules are residing. So that you're going to see the first, I'm going to, I'm going to strip this, uh, cleave this pore you'll see the very first water molecules going to the most hydrophilic sites. That's one, that one, and then that one. And then they start bridging over the hydrophobic sites to fill the pores. Each one of these water molecules has been identified by single crystal X-ray diffraction. So this is not just a computational model, but is supported by experiment. Okay. We've done a lot of prototypes that we tested in the desert, in the Arizona desert, in the Mojave desert, in Death Valley, and this is the latest. It delivers 22 liters per day at less than 0.4 kilowatt hour per liter, okay? This is an electrified device, okay? It has a MOF in it. In, in this case, it's MOF 303, and it's giving us 22 liters a day. This is no larger than a small refrigerator, okay? 
and is giving you 22 liters per day. And from previous experiments that we report in the literature, the MOF works. So far, it's been cycled for 250,000 cycles, and it's graded to last for more than six years. Okay. Now, what does 0.4 kilowatt hour mean in terms of the cost? That's the cost of water, by the way. It's the energy you have to put into the system. The rest of the system, the MOF is cheap because it's sitting there for, in the machine for seven years. And the parts of the, of the machine are just off-the-shelf parts. This is what 0.4 kilowatt hour per liter means. If I go to, let's say, Let's pick a favorable one like Arkansas. Arkansas electricity is about, on average, about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So basically what I am saying is that per liter, at least for this device, is 0.4 of that. Okay? So that's, that's like very little amount of money. That's about 4 cents per liter. And each, uh, well, on average, in the United States, people drink about three liters of water per day. And that means about $100 per year. We're probably spending more money on, the, on bottled water per person. OK, but now comes the real, I think, important thing for reticular chemistry, is that now, if I want to cut the cost of this lower, I, I either have to lower the energy or make a material that has higher capacity. And so chemistry comes in. Here's MOF 303. And all I want is to stretch it. I can't go to mesoporous. I have to stay in the microporous region. So I add two carbon atoms. I install surgically two carbon atoms. And that gives you 50% more water. So the four cents that I gave you now became two cents. If a village of a thousand people is, is using this water, now I can, I can provide more water per person or provide 1,500 people with, with water. This is, the, this is just to show you that, in fact, it's cyclable and takes up more water. OK, so where are we in water harvesting? This is for one ton of moth. If you're not, if you're not electrified, uh, you deliver 2,250 liters of water per day, every day, for many, many years. No energy input, and so you have one cent per liter. If it's electrified, then it's one ton of moth, gives you 25,000 liters of water per day, and at about, depending on the model, two to three cents per day. And that's just the beginning. That's just the pre-commercialized model. OK, so that's the good news. OK. The reason I named my lecture the modus operandi is because I wanted to, it's not enough that we do well. We need to do very well. And we need to exceed the expectations. OK, we're already a great field, but we want to be greater because we have to compete, we have to be in line with all those great materials that advance civilization. And so we need to reflect on what we're doing and what are the major, major um, drawbacks. And uh, this is major drawbacks in chemistry in general, but reticular chemistry, I think, is positioned to address them. Our research is time consuming. OK? Our students are trying too many conditions to get their crystals or whatever they're doing. And they're not really exploring the entire condition space. We're resource heavy. If you come to my lab, we have jugs and jugs of disgusting solvents, organic solvent, toxic. We're wasteful. It's unsustainable. Chemistry will not be done this way in 20 years. So we need to prepare for it. The workflow is not cost effective. OK, research is expensive. Students, researchers are very expensive. And the workflows that we have are not really well set up. OK, my lab, actually, the, cap the if you go into my lab, 
It hasn't changed for 80 years. It hasn't been renovated for 80 years. <laughs> and it's a human dependent activity that fraught with error, variations in quality. And this is what bothers me the most about the practice of chemistry, is that we have what I call premature adjudication. We always have researchers coming to us saying, it's not going to work or it didn't work. And they will list 12 reasons why it didn't work. And none of those reasons are scientifically viable. They are not based on sound science. So we actually intellectualize failure instead of just doing the experiment. We, we promote, the way we do chemistry is that we promote comfort zones. Student comes in, researcher comes in, they learn from the senior ones, they learn from their biased professor, whatever, and so it leads to incremental science. Solving and analyze, you can't even begin to solve and analyze complex problems, okay, because we don't have the tools in the lab. Predicting and forecasting is awful in chemistry, okay? And whatever we're doing is not even scalable. You can't take what I do in the lab and get somebody in another lab or another in the world to actually build on it with ease. They have to get into more field for a few years before they start contributing. That shouldn't be the case. People should be able, just like banking, people should be able to scale across different parts of the world. And, and many researchers don't take the long view and societal impact. So that we have a lot of issues, and, and the good news is that I think AI is going to fix it, is going to help to fix some of these issues, that is if we embrace it. And so we started doing that. We created what I call the dis digital discovery cycle, and uh, in concept it's not new, it's about taking robotics, doing image recognition, building data sets, taking machine learning, modifying machine learning, and then getting the machine to give you conditions under which, in this case, to crystallize ZIFs, okay? Even at this primitive level, we got the cycle to work automated from beginning to end. Of course, humans are present to check for qualities and things like that. And this is the, ultimately, this is the result. I want you to focus on the black line and the blue line. The black line is what students are doing without AI. The, the blue line is what the result of that cycle is. So we get a slight improvement in the results of, we make more crystalline, more compounds than what we used to do. And in chemistry, this improvement is a huge deal because that could mean the difference between a material that takes up water from air or the material that doesn't. So any kind of improvement is welcomed. And so I want to show you the result of that experiment is that you make ZIFs, even ZIFs are a well-farmed area. You still make new ZIFs. These are obvious in the art, okay? Many new ZIFs that are obvious, I would say, in the art, but also others that are not obvious in the art, such as this one, this one. Uh, this one, this one, and this one, and this one. Okay, so that's, that cycle is about building the foundational model to aid in discovery of new materials. And I just showed you even at the, our very, very primitive level, we can make new materials that are not obvious, both obvious in the art, but some that are not obvious in the art. Okay, so I want to close by sharing with you another aspect of modernizing our labs and what we do, to addressing the drawbacks that I, and that's LLMs, using LLMs, and in this case, chat GPT, okay? My students have been able to design chat GPT prompts that get you text mining, image mining. They even made a supervisor, molecular editing, and even a research group. So I'd like to share with you very quickly the aspect of text mining and research group. 
We took... Oh, sorry. We took 250 MOF papers, and with prompt engineering, just common language typed on a computer, asked ChatGPT to extract 10 different parameters dealing with starting material, solvent, temperature, you know, the usual things in synthesis, and tabulate the result. And it did that within two weeks. We actually had to cut and paste the experimental condition into ChatGPT, but now the students can do it automatically. Um, ChatGPT tabulated that information, and when we checked it by hand, it was 95% accurate. And the 5% that were inaccurate is because the authors had misplaced the synthetic conditions or something like that. Okay? And we could use this information to predict the synthetic conditions for different MOFs. That these are known MOFs, but we can predict them based, Chad GPT can predict the synthetic conditions for these accurately. Okay, so why is this important, aside from predicting condition? It's important because our researchers now can have facts in front of them when they decide what conditions to use for crystallization. Now they make decisions based on facts rather than chemical intuition or expertise derived from their colleagues or from their PI. Okay, the research group is interesting. Here's a cough that we deemed would be interesting for water harvesting from air. How long do you think it would take to crystallize this cough? This is an expert community. One year? How many people will say that it takes one year to crystallize this cough? Two years? How about two years? Okay. I'm going to ignore those data points. <laughs> Typically, it will, take, it will not take you two weeks. It will take you at least one year to perfect the crystals. And so the students automated the research group so that not only will ChatGPT give them the starting materials, where to buy it from, program the robot, uh, uh, determine what kind of glassware you need, analyze the results, document them. And it took only two weeks. Did you hear that? <laughs> and that's, that's experiment number nine, no crystals. Experiment 84, crystals. Do you know how pleasurable that is to me? I've saved so much money. Okay. And now I can get to the discovery, to realizing my discovery or my design much faster. Two weeks. Porosity, optimizing porosity. We all know how painful that is. Again, very short time. Within two weeks, you can optimize the porosity. OK, I'm going to skip over this. But we can take papers and their supplementary information and actually ask ChatGPT to ask questions about them and answer those questions. And it does that beautifully. One hop questions or questions that would require two hops, meaning two places in the manuscript to search for that information. ChatGPT is magnificent, and I recommend all of you to use it. I won't go over this. I'm going to read a poem for you. I hope you like it. OK? But please just listen, because the words are important in this poem. <laughs> In the silence of the laboratory, where dreams converge, reticular chemistry weaves threads with a boundless urge. Imaginations dance with molecules unseen, creating structures from the void where aspirations convene. From the depth of thought, to the touch of grace, molecules gather in their destined place. In the emptiness where possibilities align lies the design of a future serene and fine.
with the effortless harmony, they come together, crafting frameworks for challenges, weather or weather. For, from hydrogen's whisper, summoning clean energy's call, to carbon's sigh, embracing air purity for all. Solving mysteries that span the sky, trapping water from air where hope runs high. Born from a love that sparked in days of old, for molecules and mysteries yes, yet untold. To the wider community whose tireless endeavor pioneered the field, expanding horizons forever. In laboratories where passion takes flight, reticular beauty blooms shimmering bright. Invisible bonds like threads of fate's design hold the promise of a world divine. Where emptiness blooms with purpose and might, in reticular wonders where dreams alight. So raise a toast to all the creators of passion and vow, to molecules beloved then and now. For in their union, hope finds its wings in reticular marvels where the soul sings. I titled the poem, Reticular Marvels. And it was written by Chad GPT 3.3. <laughs> It was prompted, prompted and lightly edited by me. And it's amazing, it, it was generated in less than a second. As soon as I hit the return button, it came up. I did very mild edits and there it was. I'm trying to make a point. Let us not be like the rest of chemistry and embrace change. Chemistry is about studying change, isn't it? Let's embrace change, not push away this potentially a very powerful tool that can help us in many different ways, as I have illustrated. So what remains now is to thank my amazing students. Some of the older students are here who have persisted with me, who put up with me, who shared my enthusiasm and my intensity. I want to thank them all including these current ones, to, uh, for their patience and for sharing um, their hard work to develop uh, our work. And I want to thank the financial institutions, as well as I want to thank all of you. It's real pleasure to see many of you and to make new friends. We've known each other for many, many years, and it's really a pleasure always to come to a MOF conference, especially this one where Dan Zhao has really done a great job in, in putting it together. <laughs>